Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia. Today I'm bringing to you Dr. Mark Burnley from Loughborough University in England. He's an expert on critical power. So during cycling, critical power is the power output that you can hold essentially forever, but you know, in reality for, for several hours. So it's almost entirely aerobic contribution to the energy needs with very little anaerobic. And what's analogous to that during running is critical speed, which is the speed duration relationship, but also the, um, the distance prime, which is, gives you an indication of the anaerobic capacity. So what we did is we compared and contrasted different animals across the animal kingdom uh, in terms of their speed duration. So it's really interesting. We talked about humans, of course, but also other creatures such as uh, mice, rats, even crabs. Uh, and we also discussed some really athletic animals so that uh, horses, um, dogs such as greyhounds, uh, the pronged horned an uh, antelope. And even though critical speed hasn't been measured in all of these animals, they've been estimated and they, they come up with some quite remarkable numbers. Um, and the funny thing I thought was um, that dogs, it's not possible really to measure critical speed with dogs because they're too smart. So they, they cotton on pretty quickly that, uh, you know, what's going on here? That we're trying to, you know, increase the speed um, during exercise on a treadmill. So they just jump off. So uh, I found this really interesting. I think you will too. So stick around. Hi, Mark. How are you? Thanks for coming on yeah. exercise. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. So we're going to be talking about speed duration relationship across the animal kingdom, which is which is interesting. Um, but before we do that, I like to often ask people like, you know, how did you end up where you are as a researcher? Were you like a interested in research first and then, you know, decide to do exercise stuff? Or were you like a sporty sort of exercise type first and then thought, wow, maybe I could make a career out of this? Like, how did it? Uh, yeah, I think with, with me, it was sort of a, a, a little bit of both. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, I was sort of, you know, the, the, the Olympics I was watching were the kind of the Sebco, Steve Ovet, Steve yes. Cram era middle mm -hmm. distance yeah. running. So, you know, mm -hmm. from a British perspective, that was kind of a really big deal at the time mm -hmm. when, you know, it was one of the only Olympic events we were really good at at the time. Well, it was a big deal for um, us in the colonies as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. No, that was yeah. always, that was a huge, that was amazing um, time period for British. Yeah. But, and, and the interesting thing was watching, just watching the events, it was, you know, obviously rooting for those guys, but also wondering why people were, you know, dropping off the back or why somebody was coming, coming off the bend in the lead and then ending up fourth or fifth. And, what was mm. happening there and kind of even back then the the, the commentators saying well they're swimming in a sea of lactic acid as like, that's interesting what they're going on about but I was only nine or ten years old at the time so I didn't, it didn't okay. really register mm. and when I was at school I, I kind of I got into a bit of music I was doing drama and then I kind of I wasn't doing very well at science I was getting E's and F's for science so I was mm. kind of a bit of a bit of a fail when I was um you know in my second year of high school I suppose and then something just clicked, we did an experiment and it was a really, really simple one of trying to understand how sticky, sticky tape was. And I had this, I suddenly, wow, I can design a, an experiment around this and, and mm. kind of did all this stuff. And the well, do I stick it here or there? Or what do I stick it to? And what mm. do I use as the thing that's going through it? How do I weigh it down? How do I measure that? And all the measurement stuff suddenly, well, that was really interesting. So that's kind of what got me into the science was doing experiments. And then mm -hmm. it just so happened. I was also getting quite good at basketball at the time. I wasn't really a runner at the time I, and I didn't really grow very much. So I got to about five eleven. So when it got to kind of college basketball, I was absolutely mm -hmm. nowhere. Um, and, but I wanted to do sport. I knew that at that point I wanted to study sport at university. Uh, got a place at the university of Brighton, uh, down on the South coast of England. And, uh, it all went from there, really. And as time went on, I got more and more interested in endurance physiology. I started running, started doing triathlons and duathlons, realized that I couldn't swim very well. So kind of did the duathlon thing. Then I realized that cycling in the winter time in the UK is a bit of a, a, a nightmare because you have to put all, you know, all the stuff you have mm -hmm. to get in for wash your bike every day and stuff. Whereas running, you just put shoes on and off you go kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, you know, got into the running side of things. But experimentally, um, we started looking at things like, well, priming exercise. So I was interested in the, the run bike transition when I was an undergraduate and I wanted to study that. And it just so happened that there were a lot of papers out there looking at repeated bouts of exercise, but with a six minute gap between them, which isn't really a triathlon transition, but you then see two different physiological responses. So that got me fascinated with 
VO2 kinetics because the triathlon literature at the time was saying, well, when you get off the bike, you then have to basically move all the blood to the running muscles. And I was kind of like, hang on a minute, they're the same muscles, so that doesn't work exactly. at all. Yeah, yeah. But it turned out there was a lot of literature at the time in contemporary exercise physiology back in the mid-1990s looking at the effect of one bout of exercise on the VO2 kinetics in another. So I got fascinated with the, the switch on of the aerobic system. And of course, the switch on of the aerobic system harks all the way back to middle distance running and the determinants of that. So, you know, some of the Spencer and Gaston work that was going on at the time as well, looking at the, the energetics of middle distance running was, was interesting to me. And that kind of got me into endurance physiology and thresholds and training zones. And then the markers and the parameters of endurance. So the VO2 max, lactate threshold, running economy, exercise mm -hmm. efficiency, kind of the Ed Coyle model that was um, big at the time, still is big, I guess, um, and trying to understand how all these things fit together and determine endurance physiology. But also alongside that, when you learn about VO2 kinetics, you learn that there are particular intensity domains that are bounded by these very same thresholds. So if you exercise below the lactate threshold, you very quickly reach a steady state VO2. Lactate doesn't really rise above resting concentrations and you can sustain exercise for an extremely long time. So that's your moderate intensity domain. Mm. If you go above the lactate threshold, you enter the heavy intensity domain. So you've got elevated lactate. Your VO2 response doesn't reach a steady state immediately. There's a delayed elevated slow component. So VO2 is higher than it should be, but it will eventually reach a steady state after 15 to 20 minutes. Lactate will also reach a delayed but elevated steady state. If you go up to the, the highest point, in that domain, you have your maximal steady state. So whether you call it maximal lactate steady state, maximal VO2 or maximal metabolic steady state, that's where that is. You go above that, you enter the severe intensity domain, and then you cannot attain a steady state. VO2 rises until you reach VO2 max. You're exhausted soon thereafter. And the higher above that maximal steady state you exercise, the more rapidly you reach VO2 max, the shorter is your tolerable duration. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that if you then plot a series of exhaustive trials in the severe domain, you get a nice hyperbolic curve, which the asymptote of that curve is what we call critical power, which is the theoretically the power output you can sustain indefinitely or infinitely. Now, it's not really that, but that's that gives you the lowest point in the severe domain. Below that, you're going to have to use some other explanation for the physiology, but above it, all of the physiology is common. So you get the same kind of physiological responses, the same kind of endpoints in terms of metabolic response, EMG response, um, VO2 response, um, also peripheral fatigue is uh, similar, although it obviously occurs at different rates above, at, at, at different powers above the critical power. So all of these things fit very nicely together. And so that's really what got me interested in critical powers, it being part of this exercise intensity domains concept, um, which is why when we were, were speaking offline, we were talking about Steven Seiler's three zone model. Mm -hmm. To me, the three zones are the moderate domain is zone one, the heavy domain is zone two, the severe intensity domain is zone three. We now know there's a fourth domain, which is the extreme intensity domain, and that's the domain above which you cannot achieve vo2 max you're exhausted before it gets there so vo2 is being driven there but it doesn't have time to get there and that's what we call the extreme domain so that's where well, that's you have i wonder if i can um, interject there because um yeah i remember when we when we measure vo2 during like a 30 like a wingate you know a 30 second mm. all-out sprint so if people don't yep. know wingate is where you the very first pedal you go as hard as you can and then you hang on for dear life um, it's interesting because if you measure VO2 during that, you end up about 95% or something at the yeah. last tiny bit of the 30 yeah. second sprint. So I'm wondering, is, is, is that fourth domain even harder than the 30 second sprint, even shorter than that? Or? Um, well, if you're doing it with constant load exercise, um, it's just the fact that you reach task failure before the kinetics have had chance to oh, so achieve you're doing the constant OTMAX. load, yeah. So, yeah, so the wind yeah. gate is not constant load. It's, it's no, no, load. It's, okay. it's all right. But it, interesting you mentioned the wind gate because one mm -hmm. of the thing, one of the first things I did in the, in the light of critical power, we had a really, really good PhD student join us when I um, joined Aberystwyth University, uh, working with myself and Joe Dowse was Annie Van Hattelow, who's now editor in chief of the European Journal of Sports Science and a professor now down in uh, in Exeter. And 
we were kind of scraping around for a project to do. And I said, well, I'm interested in kind of new methods of measuring critical power. And whilst I was at Brighton working with uh, the likes of Jeanne Durkel and Gary Brickley, we'd been using 90 second all out exercise to try and measure VO2 max. And when I was doing my PhD Viva with Brian Whip, we showed him around the labs and we had an isokinetic bike, which we had to, back in the day, this is before loader isokinetic bikes were really widely available. We had our technicians design a bike that had SRM power cranks on it that you could bolt onto a treadmill. The treadmill belt would then drive the wheel. It was a fixed gear. So the faster you drove the treadmill, the, the higher your cadence, but it was isokinetic because you're measuring power from the power crank. And uh, Brian said, well, what, what's that bike for? It's an isokinetic bike. We've been doing 90 second work trying to measure VO2 max. He said, oh, well, could you also measure critical power with that? Because presumably if you exercised for long enough and hard enough, you would use up. So one thing I haven't mentioned is the curvature constant parameter. So the curve of the critical power function, the asymptote of that curve is critical power, which is your heavy severe domain boundary. But there's also a parameter that gives you how much curvature there is which we call right. W prime, which is very loosely equivalent to your anaerobic capacity, if you like, if you want a, a, a concept yeah, yeah. that why, you're probably familiar with that's similar. Just, yeah, I just want to, I think we're throwing a lot of people, uh, things at mm. people. I thought when you said Brian <coughs> Whip, Brian Whip, it could be a good opportunity to sort of uh, mention some of these people that have been involved, so David Paul, Brian Whip. Did you work with... Uh, them on, <laughs> and I know um, obviously you mentioned um, Anna. Oh, what's her name? Van Annie Van Hattelen. Yes, I know her name because I did some nitrate mm. stuff. But um, Andy Jones, I think. Do you want to just tell me how you fit into all that? Have you worked with those people? Have they come at this from different angles? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. So my PhD supervisors at Brighton were um, Joe Doust, who was um, the head of area at Brighton down there, and Andy Jones, who was at Manchester Met at the yeah. time, but had been mm -hmm. a student of Joe's at Brighton. Mm -hmm. And we were all, uh, myself, uh, Helen Carter, Andy Jones, Jamie Pringle started his PhD the same day as me. He was doing VO2 kinetics work as well. And uh, he's gone off and done loads of really good applied stuff with EIS and, and worked with elite athletes on, off the back of that. But Andy Jones was my PhD supervisor. That's and, what I figured, but I didn't, I'm um, not sure. Okay. So, so what essentially happened was, um, to cut a very long story short, Annie Van Hattelow became my PhD student. And then mm -hmm. Annie got a job as a postdoc in Exeter. Um, yes. and then subsequently That's transitioned the into stuff. lecturing at it so mm -hmm. did all the nitrate stuff from there so she was kind of in the right place at the right time for that and then david um, paul and brian david right? paul yes. brian yeah that, that's another interest so david paul and brian we were obviously colleagues from way back when because they did the original um physiological validation of critical power in 1988 uh, so david paul was uh brian whip's phd student um, Andy Jones and Brian Whitten knew each other very well because Brian and Andy both come from Wales, so they have that connection. So they always talk about Welsh rugby whenever they, they met up. Um, and David Paul is also a Welshman, so it's kind of that's, oh, that's kind of that, that's uh, three Not musketeers, if you like. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, and Andy did his postdoc with Carmen Wasserman in UCLA okay. um, mm -hmm. and also with Tom Barstow. Right. This is, you know, everybody's connected here. So then Tom Barstow moved with David Paul to Kansas State. Um, and then Brian came back to the UK and worked loosely collaborative with Andy on, on some critical power stuff. But then Brian examined my PhD. Um, mm -hmm. And we started working with David Paul on various projects um, through Andy uh, when he was down in Exeter working on, for example, they used uh, 31 PMRS to study the critical power concept, showing that there was, you know, metabolic threshold associated with critical power. So below critical power, your fossil creatine can reach a steady state above critical power. It can't. Same with inorganic phosphate, for example. Um, so I then took that on um, and looked at the fatigue profile. So looked at isometric models of um, mm. exercise looking below and above critical torque, showing that there was also a fatigue threshold. So peripheral fatigue develops four to five times more rapidly above critical power compared to below it. Yeah, so maybe so that's all it's good to come in because you mentioned the, yeah. the curvature. So that you get that mm. same sort of curvature with isometric contractions and yes. 
yeah um, yeah yeah so maybe just bring it in there again like you were saying yeah, about that. yeah yeah so yeah that that curvature constant parameter is um w prime that's a fixed amount of work that you can do above critical power so mm -hmm. typically so i give, give you my figures when i was younger and fitter i'd have a critical power around 250 watts and my mm -hmm. w prime is about 15 kilojoules so i could do 15 kilojoules of work above critical power mm -hmm. before i reached exhaustion so you can work out if you do a certain number of watts above critical power then you can do that many watts for a certain amount of time equivalent to burning your entire w prime so okay. that's basically how it works. If you do a very high power, but a very high work rate, you're going to burn through that 15 kilojoules okay. much faster. And that's but, but, what you're creates saying that, that is pretty rigid, Because this is where yeah. my extent of my knowledge sort of runs out. So that mm. so that is pretty reproducible, is it? That, that, yeah. That, OK. OK. Yeah. Cool. So and that's that's where Brian, when, when we showed him around the lab, that's where Brian came in and he said, well, if you can do a long enough trial, of all our exercise, you should be able to burn through all of your W prime. And then the only power you've got left will be critical power because you've used up your W prime working maximally. So you should end up with critical power. So we kind of thought about that. And, and when we were trying to get Annie a, a PhD um, project, we uh, said, we basically said, why don't we look at this all out exercise? Yeah. And so the first thing Joe said was, well, you know, just get on a bike pedal as hard as you can and see where the power goes. So I did that. I was the, 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 the guinea pig in this particular mm. case. And I went for about two and a half minutes and I just sat down. I, can't, I, I physically cannot do any more because every single rev, it's just like a wing gate. Every rev has to be maximal, but this went out for two and a half minutes. Oh, man. I said, I'm done. I'm spent. You couldn't have gone said, flat stick from the start, surely to goodness. Well, I, I did, Tried and to. it hurts a lot. I'm yeah. sure um, your central governor or whatever it is was saying, don't do it. Yeah. Yes, there was a lot of there was a lot of mind yeah. games in there. But <laughs> when we looked at the power profile, it mm. was it seemed to be starting to plateau at a value mm. that wasn't a million miles away from where I knew my critical power was. And I said to Annie, well, if I knew I was only going to go for three minutes and if you screamed at me, I could probably do it. Um, and so that's what we did. We tried to validate that. And, and when we got the Istwith cycling team to come along, they're a bunch of Welshmen who are absolutely, well, um, they're just nutters. They, they, will, they will go into the Welsh mountains and deliberately sprint up you know, very, very steep gradients to try and beat each other and spend an hour and a half riding back. So they were the sort of perfect group to, to try and validate this thing on. And we did. We did three minutes of all our exercise and then compared it to the way we conventionally measure wow. critical power, which is to do what we typically do is you do a ramp test and then we do four or five constant load trials. Um, so we do 60% of the difference between lactate threshold and VO2 max, 70%, 80%, 100%, and perhaps 105%. And then we basically fit a curve through those data. And that gives us our measures of critical power and W prime. So and what is, we did. This is where I start thinking, hang on a minute. So the lactate threshold, what are you using? You know, what are you determining that as? Well, it's, we do that as the first sudden sustained increase above baseline. So okay. it's slightly okay. lower than the kind of delta one millimolar or delta 0.5 millimolar that you might see Ed Coyle use. But that's mm -hmm. basically, it's, it's quite a conservative lactate threshold. Um, but so, so the just longer... so people know, so yeah, so when you've got your resting lactate's about one millimole, so yeah, and you're saying you start exercise, it doesn't really change, yeah. yeah, but it doesn't mean this is the thing I always want to make people realize. I'm, I'm going back to thinking about lecturing people, is um, you know, it doesn't mean there's no not an increase in lactate production, mm. it's just you get an increase yeah. in lactate production, yeah. increase in clearance, so it's not really changing. Yeah. And you're yeah. saying you're taking lactate threshold LT1 yeah. just when it starts to go up. Yeah, you're not worrying that's, about that's, oh one millimole above resting. No, 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 no. Okay, no. so, oh, so that, cool. that's the way you go. I mean, you have two independent reviewers look at it to make sure they agree and that kind of thing. So yes, yeah, it's yes. all kind of above board. We can also do it through gas exchange as well. So looking at the V slope method. So looking at the break point in um, which is VCO two against VO two. Yeah, it's it's a trickier one yeah. to do. But it's mm -hmm. slightly faster because you can do it with a ramp test rather than a you know, staged okay. incremental yes, test. Yes. Um, so just to step so, back again. So you got your lactate yeah. threshold, and then you have four or five. Steady state, and where do you do those at as a percent of? So, so we do that at uh, sixty percent of the difference between lactate threshold and VO two max. So, okay. mm -hmm. we we anticipate that the critical power is going to occur somewhere between forty and 
55% of the difference between lactate threshold okay. and VO2 max. So it's mm -hmm. above lactate threshold, but below VO2 max. So you take 60% delta, 70% delta, 80% delta, 100% mm -hmm. of VO2 max and 105%. Those would be your five predicting trials. And you basically, on separate days, exercise people to exhaustion at each of those work rates. Sorry, and why are you doing this? You can... If you think it's between here and here, the critical power, why are you doing those really hard ones? High ones? So what you're trying to do is define the curve. So you're trying to essentially in each of those bouts, you're trying to burn W prime away at a different rate so that you can get that curvature. Oh, you get that curvature. Okay. And then you can predict what critical power so you is. You want to have the full sort of slope rather yeah, than just yeah. the bit. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So and essentially what those those work rates do is give us times to failure of between about two and 15 minutes. Um, and that gives us a, a, a good range of data with which to then predict critical power. It's not absolutely essential that they're exactly between two and 15 minutes because you're setting work rates, you're not setting durations. So mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a lot of um, what I would say nonsense in the literature at the moment saying that the two to 15 minutes range is um, it's forbidden to go outside of those limits. It's not provided you've got data that's clearly in the severe domain. It could be shorter than two minutes. It could be, you know, it could be up to 25 minutes, but provided you've got that VO2 rising to VO2 max and you're reaching VO2 max at the, at exhaustion, mm -hmm. you're in the severe domain. So it's still a valid mm -hmm. trial. So you determine the trial's validity based on the physiological responses. So what we typically do with uh, critical power testing is we will also measure gas exchange alongside doing the times to failure. So you actually got those measures and you can be confident that you're looking at non-steady state work. Um, if, you do, if you do it in a field, you don't necessarily have to, and you probably won't have pulmonary gas exchange, then you have to be perhaps a little bit more careful about the ranges of, of um, times you use because you haven't got that physiological validation of it. But we find that works really well. Um, and because you're talking about endurance athletes exhausted themselves inside typically 20 minutes they don't have a problem going to the cool. limits there mm -hmm. so they're, they're, they're quite capable of doing that um, and what we did in the just to cut a very long story short what we did in the, the uh, Annie's uh, PhD thesis was compare the conventional measure of critical power to the end test power in a three minute all-out test so we just take the last mm -hmm. 30 seconds of that three minutes average of the power and compare it to critical mm -hmm. power and it turned out to be exactly the same. So within you know, two or three watts in most people, critical power and the end test power um, occurred at, at the so you're at saying if functionally they the go, same power. If they go as hard as you, if they, you got me on a bike now and you say, okay, I want you to go as hard as you can um, for three minutes, basically, for, and going yeah. for the first pedal stroke as hard as you can, you're saying yeah. you actually end up at, essentially at critical power. I would have thought you would, you would get too knackered. You would end up. Um... You would think so. It's a, it's surprising because um, when we've sort of done this jumping off the bike, you know, because I've done you know dozens of these tests in the past, so a bit of a glutton for punishment. But one thing we also did was kind of what you what you notice is that certain muscle groups seem to get more tired than others. So particularly the rectus femoris gets very very tired. So if you jump off the bike and try and run down the corridor, you cannot mm -hmm. lift your knees at all. Um, back, but back to your you, simulating you, getting off yeah, the bike in the triathlon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you <laughs> you can you can still you've got enough muscle power essentially to achieve critical power after um, sprinting for three minutes. The other thing we did was we we did the same sort of thing isometrically, and mm -hmm. uh, so doing three seconds contraction, two second rest, and it turned out you needed five minutes to achieve a clear plateau in the force or the torque. And that's been replicated in hand grip, in um, bicep curls. Um, so we were doing this with the quadriceps. But you, you, could also, you can also then measure the critical torque using the same sort of thing. You just do it as a percentage of MV. So a series of you know, 45, sure. 50, 60, 65% MVC, create, create the curve again, and you can get a critical torque. And it turns out that doing a five minute all out test and taking the end test torque, mm -hmm. and comparing it to critical torque, that's the same again. So it seems to be, irrespective of the exercise modality you use, you can determine critical power from all out exercise, which is quite nice in a sense that it doesn't matter how you burn through your W prime. Once that's burnt through, you either have to stop because you're asking for a power that's higher than critical power, or you have to drop your power to critical power mm 
to be able to continue to or below critical power okay. to be able to continue the exercise. So because most people don't have access to gas analysis and lactate measurements and things like that, are you saying that if they have a, a power meter, so you know if they've got Swift or something like that, yeah. they can they can do an all out three minute test and what they end up with at the end is can, they can use as their critical power? In principle, if they go truly all out. All so out from the start. And we'll be have, yelling and screaming we, at them as well. Yes, we, we also do familiarization sessions because it's a very alien thing, particularly for a cyclist to do, because they've spent mm. years and years and years working on pacing themselves. And the one thing you cannot do in this test is pace yourself. And you can mm. tell immediately when you look at the power profile, it kind of bottoms out and then goes back up again. Mm. Well, clearly you weren't working all out, so there, there's an element of pacing yeah, in there. And when you ask, and not, yeah. yeah, and when you and, and it's, it's still a, it's still a really hard test when you do that. But when you point okay. out to them, well, we can't use this because you paced it. They kind of go, well, yeah, I did. It was really hard, but yeah, I, I kind of lost it in the middle. And we just say, no, you've just got to go. Every single rev has it got is, to be a maximum. It effort. is a funny one, isn't it? Because um, yeah. I was thinking it reminded me a bit of when you know when you do a VO2 max test. So often people finish and they go oh maybe I could have done mm. one more yeah workload yeah I, after several years I, I got I cottoned on to that one so I'd say to them yeah we want you to go as long as you possibly can and we don't want you finishing saying maybe I could, do, could have done one more yeah workload. yeah yeah exactly so, yeah, so it's, it's, a kind of, yeah. it's a different mindset really but once they've got that it's a pretty reproducible I mean we looked at the reproducibility quite early on and it's a reproducible test once you familiarize them and they kind of cottoned on to what they've got to do it's a very reproducible test. So you end up with the same endpoints every time. The other thing is you can also work out the integral of, uh, so the integral above the end test power, basically mm -hmm. the area over the curve, turns okay. out to be pretty close to W prime for obvious reasons, because you've burned through it. So if you just measure how much work you've accumulated above that end test power, it turns out that is a quantity not dissimilar to the W prime. So yeah, what, what I'm interested in there is um, you're saying, you know, people sort of say W prime is your anaerobic sort of capacity. So and I know you said it's not really quite mm. that. So that's what I'm wondering about. So you're saying once they get down to this uh, critical power, which is supposedly you can pretty mm. much hold forever, you're saying that's entirely sort of aerobic is the idea there. And then yeah. above that, it's got some anaerobic contribution. But you said that's not really quite true. Did you want to just flesh that out a bit? Yeah, so the, the, the not quite true thing is that it's an amount of work you can do above critical power. And we haven't yet sussed out exactly where all the energy for that work comes from. So one of the interesting things that's been shown is that hyperoxia and hypoxia can change the critical power but um and i i think it's the hyperoxia mm -hmm. also changes the w prime so mm -hmm. why would giving more oxygen change your w prime so there may be some oxygen stores okay. in there so as just well so people know um, so hy hyperoxia yeah. is breathing air above yeah normoxia so normal oxygen yeah. is 21 percent. so you're saying yeah. if you're breathing higher than normal oxygen yeah. Your W prime, which is supposedly your anaerobic capacity, is altered when it shouldn't be because yes, yeah. having more oxygen doesn't affect your. Yeah, you know, exactly. So there, there seems to be some aerobic energy of some form there. We don't know mm. quite why mm. and how because we haven't obviously kind of traced that directly. So it's not quite as simple as an anaerobic work capacity or an anaerobic capacity, but conceptually it's not far off. I would say if, if you want to just keep it in your head that. Um, as a starting point if you say your critical power is your aerobic parameter your w prime is as near as makes no difference your can, anaerobic capacity i wonder if i can ask you something because i think you mentioned gaston were you talking about paul gaston earlier yeah or yes because i i was actually on one of his papers with his maximum accumulated mm -hmm. oxygen deficit and medbo was all that yeah all the rage is that still a yeah. thing is that still uh uh it's not really because one of the problems with the maximal accumulated oxygen deficit is the slow component so we know that there's understanding what the actual oxygen demand is during exercise above critical power is virtually impossible right. because it's changing as a function of time so whilst you'll get you know if you if you measure a maximal accumulated oxygen deficit it will give you a number which will probably vary if you've got a power athlete versus an endurance athlete there'll be a clear difference in okay. the accumulated oxygen deficit in each case but because you don't know precisely what your oxygen demand is at any given time it's not something that you're going to be able to say you know this is a 
if you like, a valid measure of your anaerobic capabilities, your anaerobic energy stores, if you like. Mm. Um, really and truthfully, you, you know, homogenate biopsy measures and some, you know, close thinking is, is as, as good as you're going to get on that, really, basically. So why don't you tell me then, okay, so so you've got this critical power, whether it's, you know, using the your, your lactate measurements, your oxygen consumption, all that, which is obviously yeah. pretty difficult yeah. to do for your average punter. Uh, or it's the somehow getting someone to do a full, yeah. full on three minute test. Yeah. Then what do you do with that? Do you then go, okay, well, I've got a, an event that lasts this many minutes. This is how much I've got total. Uh, this is yeah. how many watts I can do. Is that the idea? Yeah. So it will give you a performance, um, essentially a performance envelope in the severe intensity domain. So if you're, and, and pursuit riders and track riders use this an awful lot because if you're a pursuit rider, um, if you're in the team pursuit, for example, you've got situations where you're going to be exercising above critical power for the whole race, mm -hmm. but also you're going to be in the wind and then shielded for quite some time. So you're looking at your four riders and you want to know, OK, who's got the largest W prime? They're probably going to be your starting man because they're going to burn through that, you know, at the start to get the, you know, overcome the inertia. Um, you're also going to think, well, who's got the highest critical power because they're going to be the ones who are probably going to be late in the race. And you might want to say, well, we only need to get three guys over the line so we can completely burn one person's W prime and let them drop off the back. And that might optimize our performance. So there's some quite complex things you can do with mm -hmm. the modeling of critical power and performance, especially in groups. And the same is true of rowing, for example. So you'll have rowers with different critical um, powers and W prime attributes. You might want to put somebody with a certain attribute in the stroke seat versus somebody behind and so on and so forth. So trying to work out what your best mix is to optimize performance. But for an individual athlete, mm. if you have say a 5k run, and it will be, we're now kind mm. of perhaps mixing things up a bit because speed, the equivalent yeah. in um, running would be critical speed and mm. distance prime. So it's not an amount of work you can do above critical speed. It's a, an amount of distance you can accumulate above critical speed. So you want to know what your critical speed is, what your D prime is. That will tell you what your optimal 5K pace will be. Mm -hmm. So you get over the line just as you burn through the last of your D prime is, is, mm -hmm. would be your optimal race strategy. And one of the things that critical power and critical speed suggests is that there is no optimal strategy there in the sense that you could have a fast start or a slow start and there shouldn't be a, you know, there's not a, a, a magic answer to, to the best way to do it. You could do it even paced. Uh, although one thing we, we haven't quite worked out is why it is for relatively short races, perhaps 800 meters, a fast start seems to be the way to go because that seems to accelerate VO2 kinetics early on and then you mm. slow down that might preserve some of your anaerobic capabilities for later on for example um so you know there may be some you know some element of optimality for relatively short races but what the critical power concept says is you've got this energy store and you've got this sustainable rate um, so the, the critical speed or critical power and how you manage those would dictate what your performance ends up being it's interesting because I don't know if you know Brad Aspet. He was I was associated with him at one stage. Mm. I, mean, I was on a couple of his papers, and I was surprised because being a being an old ten k runner, I always thought, you know, oh, you get fired up at the start and you go out too hard, and it's partly the adrenaline. Mm. And I was always thinking, oh, yeah. I just ran more even pace. But he actually found the the, the going faster at the start was also best with his pacing mm. stuff. So that yeah. fits for that. I think he was yeah. measuring oxygen kinetics. Not sure now I'm on the paper, mm. but um, yeah, all right. So. So yeah. now is this, is this, um, you, so I, I know we talked earlier on as well about zone two and mm -hmm. all this. So, so I might, we might just start thinking about that as well. So it just so happens, as I said, before we came on here, it just, I didn't plan it, but we had, you know, mm -hmm. Michael Joyner talking about different kind of training strategies. Then Andy Coggan was on saying, you know, there's nothing that special about zone two. And then Stephen Sealer on talking about um, polarized training, et cetera. And now I've now I've seen you on Twitter talking about zone two mm. and zone, zone zero and zone one and you know a bit of tongue in cheek. Tell me how does this critical power sort of fit am, amongst that? Is it zone two? Is it high zone two? Is it low zone three? Whatever. Yeah. And, so um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So really and truthfully, these the map quite nicely onto to Stephen Siler's three zone model. So uh, for me, zone one 
that's moderate intensity exercise below lactate threshold is zone one. Mm -hmm. Zone two is between lactate threshold and whatever you measure as your maximal steady state, whether that wants to be maximal lactate steady state, whether it's functional threshold power, whether it's critical power, that's zone two between those two landmarks. And then zone three is above critical power. Now, we could also, you might want to, because the funny thing about that, when you actually look at how those zones are partitioned, if you take your maximum sprint power, let's just make it easy and say mine to 1,000 watts. So now I've got critical powers, 250 watts. Yep. My maximal power is 1,000 watts. Well, you know, three quarters of your exercise capability in terms of your power producing capability is taken up by zone three. So mm -hmm. from 250 up to 1,000. So you probably do need to partition that in some way. So um, when you're doing sprint interval training, for example, you might want to call that zone four where you're perhaps in the, the extreme domain, although that hasn't been used yet because most endurance training is set by heart rate. And once you get too far into zone three, when you get above VO2 max, heart rate becomes less and less yeah. useful because you simply oh, yeah. can't, you both, see, you both get cardiovascular drift, but also mm -hmm. the heart rate simply doesn't respond fast enough. Your interval is over before you've, exactly. your heart rate's got to where it should yeah, do. Yeah. So you can't be looking at your watch trying to regulate your speed from it. So it's, you know, which is why people do track sessions, because you can just use a stopwatch at that point. Um, so in terms of the zones, that's how they map. So um, the three zone model fits with the exercise intensity domains model very well, albeit we don't have anything to call you know, extreme exercise yet, partly because, again, it's not something that you would prescribe off heart rate because it's, it's not mm -hmm. something that's usable in that sense. Um, Andy Coggan's version of the zones is, is a, essentially a different philosophy about what is it you're trying to do in each of these sessions. Are you trying to develop this? Yeah. Well, then that's where you have to work that kind of thing. So, and I can see merit in that. Um, but my bias is to think of things in terms of, well, how is the physiology going to respond when I do this? And so I want to know whether it's in the moderate, heavy or severe domain. And then after you've got that in place, what you want to do is, is pepper all of those zones with a variety of, of training, because at the end of the day, training is something you have to adhere to in the longer term. And so mm -hmm. having a, a varied number of sessions to do, I think, is the way to go. So, um, more interesting you know, world. whether you've got high or low volume work, mm -hmm. you really want to kind of pepper each each zone, um, not evenly necessarily, but I don't, also don't think you have to be particularly wedded to a particular distribution either, I, because... Um, as you say, all all roads lead to well, Rome me, and or was, Tokyo. Yeah, that was, that was before we came on. But yeah, we were talking about yeah. this thing that um, all roads lead to Rome. But then Michael Joyner said, "Well, actually, Tokyo." So people are yeah. trying to catch yeah. up. It's because the five thousand meters, the Tokyo Olympics, the, the first, second, and third people did very different training. So you kind of see mm. all roads led to yeah. Tokyo. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it has become a little bit religious. Oh, on Twitter anyway. I I, I can't mm. assume that. People on Twitter are the representative of the uh, population at large, but mm. the, the zone two thing is, seems to be just if you're not doing zone two, you, the world's going to come to an end sometimes. Yeah, and zone two sort of been um, changed somewhat. In zone two is now seen as in some circles just below lactate threshold. So mm. now you have zone one, which is a long way below lactate threshold. You may even have a zone zero, which is, um, you know, kind of habitual physical activity, more or less, where you're kind of walking to the shots, that kind of thing. Um, and that, in a sense, is, um, I don't know whether you'd call that, it, it, it might be a bit controversial for me to say that's perhaps a little bit ableist, because if you're 80 years old and you have some kind of underlying um, cardiovascular or respiratory disease, walking to the shops, you're going to be in the oh. severe domain. So just sure. talking about habitual physical activity, as you know zone zero is really easy for, for some people this isn't easy and that's mm -hmm. you know we perhaps have to um appreciate that a little bit more when we, we we often talk about the fittest end of the spectrum you know where there's a very large proportion of the population that aren't as fit and funnily enough you go to local race meets and the interesting thing is to see the people who are coming in last and they're obviously very keen runners but they're kind of walk running a 5k and you think, well, if those people have chosen to do this because they're kind of passionate about exercises, what is the rest of the population that we're not seeing? Mm 
what is their exercise mm-hmm. capacity like? Mm-hmm. So that's that's quite eye opening when you think yeah. about it. Um, but yeah, so just going back to the, the the zone two thing, zone two seems to have been recently co opted as just below lactate threshold as being the key uh, the key session to be doing um, regularly. Um, now, I'm not sure there's any solid evidence to support that. But of course, the other thing about training and the, the whole thing that makes it muddy and messy is that the way training studies are done do not reflect the way athletes train. Sure. And you can't really replicate the way athletes train in a bunch of untrained people because that won't work either, because you'll mm-hmm. end up just destroying them, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, when you look at the literature, if you're designing a training study, if you've got any sense, you'll do higher intensity exercise because you get more bang for your buck in the short exactly. term, whether that works, works in the long term. Done. Yeah, exactly. because yeah. And one of the things I always tell my students is, well, why are, why are training studies eight weeks long? Well, that's because that's how long university terms are. And most of the subjects are going to be university students and you've got to do the maxes first and, and then yes yeah. and you've got, you've got to do the pre-tests and if you've got any sense you do this after christmas well in in the northern hemisphere you do this after christmas because that's when people are not doing a lot of training they might quite like to do some indoor supervised mm-hmm. training right so our most effective training studies have been done between january and march because that's when people have kind of had too many of the pies over christmas kind of thing and then they want to get a they want to get very motivated to do exercise again and they're coming at their least fit of the year. I guess in Australia, you'd want to do it through our summer. So you'd want to do it through, you know, July to September is probably your best time to do a training study. Well, uh, in Australia. But there's also the eating too many pies we get at Christmas as well. Yes, yes. Although yeah. we're on our summer break then as well, because we have our yeah. summer holidays over Christmas. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, hey, this has been a great background. I'm sure it feeds yeah. uh, beautifully into the, the, the topic. So uh, mm. speed duration relationship across the animal kingdom. So we've been tending to be a bit human centric, which I think is fair enough. Yeah. But why don't we think about other animals? And what, what did you mm. have in mind there? Yeah. So uh, this came from a little project. I, I did a YouTube video a while back talking about animal uh, athletes and kind of horses and pronghorn antelopes and, and various other creatures. And I was then contacted by an associate of Craig Sale, who said, well, I'm, I'm doing an edit. I'm editing this uh, comparative physiology section on comparative exercise physiology. I liked your YouTube video. Would you like to do something on this? And I thought, well, I don't just want to do VO2 max because that's been done quite a lot by, um, you know, um, C. Richard Taylor and um, uh, Knut Smith Nielsen. Various people have done this kind of thing before. Why don't I do the speed duration relationship in animals? Because I know there's lots of stuff on humans. There's been some stuff done on horses. Um, I know there's been some stuff done on some of the um, crustaceans and lizards. Maybe I can put this thing together. What about fish and birds and that kind of thing? So I started looking and it got more and more and more interesting. And uh, there's uh, a guy called Bob Full uh, from uh, University of California, Berkeley, who's done a lot of work on comparative physiology. Um, He's now working on nanobots and all sorts of other interesting things now based on the movement of cockroaches, for example. Um, So maybe one day you'll get, you know, an Amazon parcel that looks like a cockroach because of him. But um, he did a lot of work in the early 1980s looking at crabs and geckos and various other uh, lungless salamanders. And one of the things he did was he measured the VO2 response and the VO2 max and the the lactate responses, uh, which is, you know, quite nasty in this particular case because mm. when you measure lactate in these creatures you have to do whole body lactate which implies oh. you basically dump them in Try liquid nitrogen pulverize them and yeah mm. so it's kind of it's not something you you, you can't Talk take about the specific you know we'd say oh we do a biopsy yeah. we're only getting a little bit of yeah, yeah it's like yeah, throwing the yeah. whole yeah. human in a better yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yes exactly so you know you can't take a fingertip blood sample from a crab because they don't have mm. fingers right so anyway um, but what I wanted to do was put all this together. And the thing that kind of alerted me to this is Bob Full also did um, time to exhaustion trials on the treadmill with these creatures. So I thought, well, there's an op- opportunity now to look at critical power or critical speed. In so this can case. I can always ask you a question because we've done yeah. studies with uh, humans, but also mice mm-hmm. and rats. And yeah. we're not allowed to actually do electrical stimulation in Australia for rats and mice. So we'd be sort of blowing them with air, uh, yeah. Yeah. bursts of air and maybe yeah. giving them a bit of a pat on the butt or something yeah how do you and, and even then it's a bit iffy you know like um, yeah if they if they're reaching their max or whatever how do you do that with a what are the creatures you're talking about 
Yeah, it, it's in, I mean, it's kind of falling off the back of the treadmill is the obvious one. We, yeah. Rats and mice, David Paul's work with this, uh, uh, tried this a lot, and basically it's the self-writing thing. So if you put, to, oh. to check they're truly exhausted, yeah, you put them on their up. back, they can't back up because, you know, they're, they, they, if they can, they will, because yeah, if they, that's they the don't, they'll get rich right? bits. Yeah, that's so, but he, he also does, he does the, the, the um, the hind leg blowing as well so he's, he's okay. worked on that yeah i always thought um, that sounds yeah. pretty scary because you imagine if yeah. you're that if you think as a, as a human if you're on a treadmill until you're mm. exhausted and you can't actually stand up again yeah that's yeah. pretty tired exactly. and it's like yeah. you can't stand up for 20 seconds or something. yeah yeah exactly so okay. so I, I think you've got a, a pretty good measure there that they are actually exhausted but going back to this um the, the paper I, I started looking at this and realized that although bob fuller done uh a load of measurements of, of time to failure and had fit a curve through it. He hadn't used a hyperbolic function, he'd used an exponential function and hadn't presented any of the uh, curve parameters. So you couldn't get a critical speed from it. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I got web plot digitizer and basically replotted all of the data uh, or the historic data that I could find and then applied the, the critical power or critical speed and function. And what creatures were these again? What, um... So, uh, we had humans, which was kind of easy to do because I got mm -hmm. some data from uh, um, Rebecca Nixon, who'd worked with Andy Jones. So human runners was was easy to get. Um, there's uh, human swimmers. We've got plenty of data for. Um, then horses. We had. I'll, I'll come on to dogs in a minute because that's a bit bit tricky. Um, rats and mice. It's been done there. So David Paul and and Ver mm -hmm. Veronica Bile has also um, worked in that area too. So there's there's plenty of data there. Um, then there's the desert iguana has been measured, um, both hot and cold. I'll come on to that in a moment. Okay. Uh, the painted ghost crab, the fiddler crab, the lungless salamander. Um, you can make all of some of these up, are you? Painted I'm ghost definitely crab. not making Yes, I'll, I'll come on. Painted ghost lungless crab is a very salamander. interesting creature. Okay. I'll come on to that in a moment. And then I looked at fish and birds. And the problem with fish and birds is that um, there are no... Um, speed duration data for fish and birds as we would find them in terrestrial animals. But there is a critical speed in fish. And because fish, uh, most fish, most fish species swim automatically and swim all the time, um, mm. what they do to measure critical speed in fish is they do 75 minute stages in a swimming flume uh, at different speeds. And they keep going until the fish can no longer maintain their position oh. in the flume. Okay. And then they measure what the highest cool. speed is. In birds, it's really tricky because if you put a bird in a wind tunnel, you wind can tunnel. actually instrument them with, uh, so there are pictures of budgerigars with a face mask on, for example, mm. that has been done. Um, but the problem is the, the VO2 response in birds is not necessarily linear. So in a budgerigar, mm. it will start high and then drop down and then go back up again. So it's a U shape. Um, in Sorry, why these, is that? You know? uh, mainly because they can, they, 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 different flapping behaviors they so efficient. they have to flap very hard uh, to, to, to maintain lift early doors then they can go through an intermittent flapping phase and wow. then the wind's so heavy they can't very maintain cool. their position without um you expending a lot of energy in geese so i mean bar-headed geese has been measured as well um up to 21 meters per second they've been measured in a wind tunnel and the vo2 response is almost dead flat so of course with the wingspan that they've got you, you increase the speed, but you don't increase the, the metabolic demand because they just glide and or they just mm -hmm. subtly change wing shape so they can maintain their position in there, which is why they're such good migratory animals because they're able to minimize their energy cost and movement. So time to exhaustion hasn't been measured in these birds yet, but we can kind of infer from the speeds they're, they're able to migrate at what their critical speed mm -hmm. might be. So it'd be in excess of 21 meters per second. Oh, you reckon they just sort of sit at their critical speed, probably? Yeah, or, or, or just below just it. Under it. Um, mm -hmm. So if we, we go back to the terrestrial species, which is so it, it's easier to kind of think about. In humans, you've probably got a critical speed in a normal human runner of about four and a half meters per, uh, yeah, meters per second. Uh, and a, a distance prime of perhaps 200 meters is, is a typical human. Sorry if you don't know this off the top of your head, yeah. but meters per second i straight away try and convert it to kilometers an hour Do yeah you, so it's about 16 kilometers an hour is uh, about four points so yeah so that's for a, a good club runner um so eliud kipchoge so uh his critical yeah, speed is going to be around 21 
So that's going to be about Kilometer six meters a second. So yeah, sixteen um, so that's... kilometers an hour for your good club runner. Yeah, it's ten miles mm. an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So that, that's I'm where, sure that's they can't the keep doing that forever, though. You know, the, yeah, yeah, the, uh... yeah. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the key thing about um, the horse, for example, and it has been measured both on a treadmill, um, and we can also look at historic race data. That's one of the things I do was compare Secretariat to a bunch of other mm. uh, horses uh, and, and a bunch of other British horse racing records, mm. um, and essentially a horse's critical speed when ridden with a jockey is going to be about 14 and a half meters per second uh, so about um, 35 kilometers an hour something like that um, if you assume that if you took the rider off if a jockey's weighed about 50 kilos with tax about 55 kilos then they might be able to achieve 16 meters per second as Hang on, the uh, Americans critical are going speed. to be struggling here, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They're just going to have to learn um, metric, I think, for this. Yeah. Thing. So yeah. you're right. pro yeah, 40 miles an hour as a, as a ballpark figure. Um, mm -hmm. So that's probably the fastest critical speed that's been measured in the animal kingdom for a couple of reasons. First, Sorry, we know there are the faster horse. animals. Yes, yeah, the horse, um, so them. the thoroughbred mm -hmm. horse, mainly because they haven't measured things like the prong or antelope. Right or the mm. cheetah um, now the cheetah probably doesn't have a particularly high critical speed because it's a sprinter no, the pronghorn no. antelope does however um because the pronghorn can run 11 kilometers in about 10 minutes so it can sustain 65 wow. kilometers an hour um oh. not indefinitely but for at least 10 kilometers or more so we th we would estimate from that their critical speed is probably approaching 18 Wait, meters 10 a kilometers and how long uh, 11 kilometers in 10 minutes is what a, a pronghorn antelope can can achieve and the reason for that is it was um it used to be hunted by um the prairie lion which has died out and coyotes and so forth and they tended to be aerobic persistence hunters so and the air the prairie's wide open space um so they had to be able to move a long way mm at speed um, and that's why they evolved in that way and now they don't have any more predators apart from humans shooting them and unfortunately pronghorns can't outrun bullets mm -hmm. so um, they tend to be a trophy animal now in, in the, the uh, american midwest oh, nice. but um, nevertheless that's probably the fastest terrestrial animal um, in terms of critical speed where it gets really interesting is when you look at the D prime relationship between um, distance prime and the animal's ability. So this is where we start to move into um, mice, um, rats, and um, other animals. So mice and rats, their critical speed is we're now measuring in centimeters per second. So you know, 10, 10 centimeters per second is probably the, the sort of critical speed you'd expect to see in a rat, um, maybe 15, depending on size. Um, and their distance prime is probably up around 30 meters. So that's that's the sort of um, anaerobic capability they have. When you get down into, we haven't measured it in dogs and there's a reason for that. Um, Sorry, just before you go too far, can I just ask, yeah. do they, because the idea is, do these creatures all fit on the same sort of curve or not? You know, even mm. if they're really slow. Yeah. Oh, we can yes. back to that if you want. I just keep thinking. Yeah, about we'll that. come I'm back just... to it because that, yeah, okay. yeah, we'll, we'll build to that because that, that's kind of the, the cherry on the cake when we get. Okay. Um, so um, we haven't measured critical speed in dogs yet because for two reasons. First of all, um, most dogs will not run on a level treadmill above eight kilometers per hour for any length of time because they get wise to it and just jump off because they either but get bored or they stick white, Yeah, my little white yeah. fluffy here. <laughs> yeah, because when you say dog. A dog is not a dog, you know, if it's, it's a yeah. Great Dane or a little white dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, yeah. They, they, they cotton onto it, they just jump off. Yeah, yeah. So when they have been measured, so they, okay. they've measured VO2 max and, for example, Alaskan sled dogs, which can obviously run for pretty much yeah. ever, um, for six six to seven hours running at you know, 16 kilometres per hour. But they, of course, they run in groups and they've got a musher pushing them. So it's, it's difficult to understand their individual critical speed from that. But again, it hasn't been measured. The there have been there has been work done on greyhounds on treadmills, and there's and it's uh, in Paul and Erickson in 2003 in Comprehensive Physiology they described the uh, PhD thesis that was done in I think it was in South Africa, and he, what he did was he took about 30 ex uh, greyhound race racing dogs mm -hmm. 
and tried to measure their VO2 max on a treadmill. First thing he found was they wouldn't run at speed on a level treadmill. So it had to be at about 10, 12, 13% gradient. He also had to have a paper bag at the end of the treadmill because they're used to chasing stuff. So he had to have that paper bag. And even then he could only get them to chase it for about 45 seconds at a time. So although they were able to measure very high speeds, it, only three of these dogs were able to go for longer than 45 seconds. Only one of those three dogs would actually take on a respiratory face mask. Mm. So it took him nine years of trying in his oh PhD thesis. He managed to get one measurement of VO2 in this dog. Uh, hey, the VO2 you, max what? is about 168 <laughs> oh. uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute. So very, very high. Is that horses are about 120, aren't they? Uh, it varies. An, an elite racehorse is probably pushing 200 uh, milliliters per kilogram yeah. per minute. Uh, the pronghorn I... antelope has been measured at 300 milliliters oh, per kilogram 300 per minute. 300 milliliters so, per kilogram. And, yeah. and just to remind people, the highest, you know, it's controversial, but the probably highest yeah. measured in a human is about 90. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Now, I just yeah. thought of something when you were saying that in terms of trying to get the dogs. We actually, believe it or not, had um, sheep running on a treadmill at one stage. <laughs> and and it was really clever. The, the person that was helping us, the animal, because the animal welfare person, not surprisingly, mm. wanted to see how we're doing this because we were muscle biopsying them and mm. stuff as well. Yeah. And that was fun. No, not. Um, <laughs> but anyway, because they'd be trying to kick you and stuff, which is fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, anyway, she said, if you have another, because we were having trouble getting them to run for various reasons. Part of the reasons they'd urinate and then they'd slip away on the treadmill. Yeah. So they'd have to put super, yeah. Yeah. they'd have to glue stuff to their feet. Yeah. But she said, if you put another sheep in front of the treadmill, it will follow it because they're used to following yeah. each other and yeah. it did yeah so i don't yeah. you don't want to tell that guy after nine years like oh put another <laughs> yeah. In front of it. Yeah. but yeah that may have worked yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah possibly um but yeah obviously the, the problem with that is there are uh, up such a steep no, grade and you'd have to hang yeah. the, the dog from the ceiling the or something so, <laughs> so, so yeah the, right. it's practically difficult but anyway um so we, we don't have measurements mm -hmm. in dogs we do have too uh, if you like yeah, but we do have race measurements. The problem with greyhound racing is even if you have a, a kilometer race in a greyhound race, it's over in less than a minute. So you don't get that range for which you can define a curve. So we haven't got measurements in dogs yet. Um, having said that, the, the speed at which dogs race probably indicates their critical speed is not dissimilar to a racehorse. So that's basically where we are, which sort of fits nicely in terms of predator-prey interactions, if you think about dogs and horses and wolves and that sort of thing uh, in the wild. Um, then we move into kind of a really interesting territory where we go into non-mammalian species. So, and I mentioned Bob Full earlier and the work that he did. Um, he was just, just interested his, uh, in- name, sorry, Bob? Bob Full, F-U-L-L. -L. Okay, so he cool. did a, yep, yep. a lot of work in the early 1980s on various species, but he was just interested in how different uh, anatomies and physiologies can end up with, if you like, a similar physiological response to exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't just Bob Ford, there were other people um, doing this kind of work. So one of the, um, uh, John Adler was working on desert iguanas and looking at their endurance whether they were hot or cold. So the idea, obviously, a, a, an iguana will sit in on a, on a hot rock before it goes off and does its foraging. But what he it's found a, it's was- a reptile, right? Yes, yeah, because it's a reptile, yeah. so it's cold blooded, so it needs to warm itself up in that yeah, way. Yeah. What he found was when they, they experimentally had them at 25 degrees Celsius versus 40 degrees Celsius, their VO2 max doubled when at 40 degrees Celsius compared to 25 degrees Celsius. Something that obviously doesn't happen in humans. We don't can't mm. heat ourselves up and get a higher VO2 max. If anything, it gets lower because of blood flow distribution, that kind of thing. But what he also showed was the endurance of these creatures. So he, he had a speed duration relationship. So again, I used web plot digitizer and just replotted it, calculated the critical speed. And the critical speed doubles just like VO2 max does when you recalculate this thing. And interestingly, the distance prime doesn't change at all. So interestingly, the heating of these desert iguanas has an aerobic, quote unquote, aerobic effect. It doesn't seem to affect their anaerobic capability. And that's which, a lot more than the Q10 effect. Yes, <laughs> I exactly. Think, you know, when you talk so, about temperature, yeah, yeah, there's the old, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, the doubling of VO2 max in that case. Mm -hmm. Then we move on to um, the crabs. 
So uh, Bob Ford did some work. The really interesting thing about crabs, of course, is they have a very different cardiovascular system to us. So it's open-ended in a sense. They do walk sideways. They have gills. Yeah. So Um, very, very different. Um, And obviously they have a a tough exoskeleton. Gills. Yeah. They've got gills. mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've got gills. um, They've got a cardiovascular system, not dissimilar to ours, except the fact that at the capillary end, it's open-ended. So essentially what the, it's called hemolymph and it's uh, hemocyanin is what carries the, the oxygen. So our equivalent of hemoglobin. Um, and this is basically, it bathes the tissues and that's oh, where the, the nutrients are exchanged. And then essentially everything gets siphoned up back into sinuses and eventually returned to the gills. So that's basically how they work. So from a, an oxygen transport uh, perspective is pretty inefficient but then where they're living kind of in the um, rock pools and so forth where you know oxygen is often you know quite limited they need quite a large anaerobic capability to move around as well so there's an element of that and what he did was he measured these ghost crabs on a treadmill because the ghost crab is known as the fastest land crab in the world or or considered to be the the the, the most uh, rapid land crab so he measured these things as well. And, and the, the ghost crab has a, a critical speed of about seven centimeters per second and a distance prime of over 30 meters. So it's much, obviously much smaller than a, um, so you can probably p- fit one of these things in your hand. Um, so they're much smaller than uh, a rat or a mouse, but they've got a similar distance prime. So and then we look at- us again of the distance prime. So. This is the equivalent of the W prime. So it's the curvature constant of this uh, speed duration relationship. And he also measured fiddler crabs. Yeah, but what, what have... does that mean? Sorry, I must be a bit slow yeah. on the uptake. What's, what's it telling us then? It's the... It's the amount of distance you can cover above the critical, critical speed before you're speed. exhausted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Right key point is the fiddler crab's got quite a large capacity to do that so not the fiddler crab the the painted ghost crab has a large capacity to do that fiddler crab less so so it's got a critical speed of about four centimeters how do you normalize these things out though so when you say this crab's got a 30 Mm. yeah and this and this greyhound's got you know two k's or yeah how how do you normal how do you compare them well, there's two ways of doing it. There's, there's the, the classical scaling way. So actually fitting them all along the same curve according to body mass and then working out a, an exponent that, that works on that. I haven't done this because it's quite difficult to do with speed and distance and those sorts mm-hmm. of things. But what there is, is a thing called the endurance parameter ratio, which is where you basically take your distance prime and you divide it by your critical speed or your W prime divided by okay. critical power. What that gives you is essentially the duration of exercise you could do if you were running at double your critical speed. So um, in the case of a human, it's Mm -hmm. around about 60 seconds is, you know, what you could run eight meters per second at is about 60 seconds. So about a 400 meter race, you could run at double your critical speed, if you like. Um, In the case of the horse, it's about 20 seconds. So it's a lot lower. What it means is that, that most of the horse's uh, endurance care, most of the horse's athletic capability is derived from its aerobic system. It doesn't have a great capacity to gallop above the critical speed, but then again, it weighs half a ton. So it's it's still doing a lot of work to get there. It just has to you know carry a very large I mass. I guess that's just what that I was distance. wondering, because when you say this crab mm. can do this and that crab mm. can do that, I'm just trying to think, yeah. how do we compare it? So, you know, if yeah. you've got, yeah. got a mouse that's doing eight, mm. What was it? Eight meters a second? No, it couldn't be yeah. eight centimeters uh, a second. Ten. Is that good or bad? Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah that, exactly. So uh, to, I think yeah. the, the good or bad is if you get this ratio. And, and this is where it gets really interesting because the painted ghost crabs endurance parameter ratio is about 470 seconds. So oh, if you could, it's about seven times higher than a human's. In other words, if you had a human that had the same endurance parameter ratio as a ghost crab, a normal club runner, that 16 kilometer an hour runner we talked about earlier, would be able to run a mile in about three minutes and seven seconds, then be able to run another run to 3000 meters and break the 3000 meter world record by uh, about 90 seconds, and then be able to do two laps of honor at the same speed 
before slowing down. So yeah, right. the ghost crab is probably the world's best middle distance runner. Best it's got an absolutely enormous, absolutely enormous capacity to exercise above its critical speed. And its critical speed is not too shabby for a crab either. If Eliud Kipchoge had an endurance parameter ratio of 470 seconds, he'd run a mile in two minutes, 13 seconds. So that gives you some impression of how good the ghost crab is. Um, then we move to the lungless salamander. And this is, this is where it gets really interesting because obviously there are no lungs. And so you, you presume they've got a very low critical speed and you presume correctly. So their critical speed is about 2.6 centimeters per second. They have a distance prime of about 20 meters, which is not bad at all. In fact, it's not that far away in terms of the endurance parameter ratio from a ghost crab. But of course, it's got a very low um, overall aerobic capability. So, and the, the reason for so that relying is- relying more on anaerobic then, yeah? It's relying more on anaerobic metabolism. But again, the, the way creatures that breathe through their skin work is they often sit in streams. So they get the, the flow across their skin and they can move around. So by moving, so by slithering, essentially, they're able more. to then essentially breathe through their skin. And there have been a number of creatures, of course, you think of amphibians that do this quite a lot, breathe through their skin. There is a survival advantage to it in the sense that if you can keep your metabolic rate low enough, breathing through your skin is a perfectly viable way of um, gas, or viable means of gas exchange if you're not having to work too hard. So if you're just foraging through leaf litter or living in the depths of a pond, it's a very and very efficient way of respiring because you don't have to maintain the structures of the lungs or gills um, to to actually get the nutrients. I was going to say they don't have any work of breathing, but they do if they're yes, moving exactly. around. They, if they're moving around, yes, but that's only when they've got a relatively high metabolic rate anyway. So, and their skin is extremely well vascularized for obvious reasons in that sense. Um, but again, um, pretty good um, endurance parameter ratio in that sense as well. Um, and that's where we start to think about swimming and moving on to fish. Uh, and I've mentioned about fish, fish's critical speed. We've also measured critical speed in humans. This is where we now, for normalization purposes, start to think in terms of body length per second. Because with terrestrial creatures, there's so body plans are so different that it, mm. it's difficult to kind of to work on that, especially if you're talking about bipedalism versus quadrupedalism. In swimming, everybody pretty much moves horizontally and obviously along their, their long length. So it, it makes sense then to talk about body lengths per second. It gets a bit tricky anyway, because you also measure fish in slightly different ways. So you can measure the fork length of a fish up to the end of the fins, or you measure the body length to the, the end of the tail, if you like. So that gets a bit tricky. But nevertheless, it has been measured. Fork so length. Is that, does that military mean when you eat them what you eat? No, no, it's that that's when you kind of talk, talk about the forking of the the, um, the oh, tail yeah. fin and whether you measure to the end of that or whether you measure which the, bit the you eat. body. No, <laughs> not exactly, no. Um, right. So if you think about human swimming speed and human critical speed, it's about 0.8 body lengths per second is what you'll get a swimmer to be able to swim their critical speed. And then they've got a distance prime of about 30 meters. So mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's where the humans sit. Um, fish have been so measured. They could go double that yeah. for about 30 meters. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So um, the, the, the key thing about fish is their critical speed is measured slightly differently. So probably underestimates what their actual critical speed measures the way we do it with humans is because they do this long incremental test up to their critical speed. They don't do it kind of from the severe domain downwards. Um, but even with the very, very long uh, test, you're seeing critical speeds of between two and four body lengths per second. So at least double and possibly between two and eight times faster than a human is what fish can achieve. And that's obviously because they're streamlined, they're used to doing it, they've evolved to do it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the thing with, that really makes fish different is and when I talk about fish, I ought to qualify which fish have been measured because we haven't measured things like the great white shark because of the whole getting eaten thing. I'm to put a, um, put a melt on it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so you're not going to get very far with that. So most of the fish that have been done have been river dwelling fish, so salmon and those sorts of things, because they're small enough to fit into a swimming flume and actually measure systematically. And also there's a, a, an economic reason for doing it. Most of these studies have been done in Northern Canada, 
where there's obviously a major fishing mm -hmm. injury in the health of the fish, one of the ways of, of determining that is to look at their exercise capabilities, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the reasons why they get funding to do that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But nevertheless, um, the key difference between humans and fish is their sprinting ability. So there are really three exercise intensity domains for fish. There's kind of the normal kind of slow swimming so they're normal kind of meandering around and that, that kind of thing where they're just looking out for for food or looking out for predators then there's the transitional speed which is what their critical speed is where they're moving from not they're not they're kind of swimming more rapidly but not sprinting and then there's the bursting that they do so they do where they kind of go up the river run or where they go really hard at a, a prey or trying to escape and their burst swimming capabilities is they can they can move at more than 10 body lengths per second. So their burst capabilities are really, really good. Whereas a human sprinting speed, a human's maximal sprint you can get from the world record for the 50 meter freestyle, for example, that's about 1.5 body lengths per second. So that's the fastest a human can swim. And you think, well, that's kind of obvious because humans have to use their limbs to swim and they're not very hydrodynamic. So you've got the head and the shoulders, all this kind of stuff. So although we can swim long, we don't have anything like the teardrop mm -hmm. shape that a fish does. Um, so they have a much, much better ability to sprint than we do. And so one of the things I said in the, the paper that I wrote in the um, comparative, uh, comparative physiology and pharmacology is the um, paper that I wrote, and I'll send you a link to that uh, after the session. Um, what I said in there was there's a real opportunity amongst fish biologists to actually use the human method of measuring critical speed because they have such a great burst swimming capability. You should be able to get lots and lots of data points to be able to define your curve. Um, the other thing about it's wor probably worth pointing out that um, there aren't that many fish that have been measured because of just the physical nature of getting fish into a flume. If you think about all of the animals that have ever been measured in exercise physiology, if you took all the specimens that have ever been measured and put them in one place, you probably wouldn't have a particularly big petting zoo. It wouldn't be at that mm. impressive a place because they're very, very hard to measure these things. If you think about measuring horse VO2 max, you can't really use a Douglas bag because it will fill up too quickly. You have to do it by dilution. So you basically draw air past the nostrils and then you have a sensor somewhere in the okay. system that's measuring the output. And so you look at the, the dilution of the gases to measure VO2 max, you do the same thing with elephants, um, the same sort of thing with, with um, cows and that kind of thing. You, you can use face masks for birds, but it's very difficult to get a seal, that kind of thing. Um, so there are very few animals that have actually been measured. So when you see the, the, the plots in, in some of the review articles where you've got dog, horse, fox, wood mouse deer that kind of that's literally all the animals that have ever been measured in this on one graph so it's not actually that many um and then we move on to birds and birds is really interesting in comparison to humans because obviously humans can't fly so we don't have any real comparative data and where humans have had um human powered flight it's basically been a, a cyclogometer with wings so the gossamer albatross um mm. and interestingly one of the reasons why critical power was developed in cycling was through David Wilkie's work in the early 1960s, because he was part of the commission that set the prize money for human powered human flight. flight. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he used essentially, it was an exponential curve, but it was essentially the same sort of curve fitting that we use for critical power to work out whether or not it was even possible for a human to fly. And he and they determined- said 300 watts, wasn't it? They about said, 300 yeah. watts, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So they, they said that there should be humans that are capable of sustaining that. Uh, so there were there were essentially two prizes, one for the mile, doing a figure of eight loop of a mile, and then one for crossing the channel. And I think by the time they got to crossing the channel, they'd managed to get the efficiency of the, the, the uh, flying vehicle slightly better. So I think uh, Brian Allen, who actually did that effort, managed to produce 250 watts for about two and a half hours crossing the channel. Um, and it's really interesting to see it because it's essentially it's a, a cyclogometer with wings. So in, in the case of mm -hmm. crossing the channel, it was a cyclogometer in a plastic bag because obviously mm -hmm. he didn't want to, if he ended up in the drink, he wanted to make, make sure he wasn't going to drown immediately. But then, of course, it's a, the ultimate task to failure thing. So if you do fail, you're going to end up in the English Channel. So he, he got about halfway through and was really struggling, but then put in a super effort 
and I actually managed to climb and realized that the air was cleaner about uh, 10 15 meters above mm -hmm. and able to exercise at a lower power to get a, a certain speed so in the end managed to to uh, to land that uh, on the french coast but the, the the reason that's interesting is that he was still cycling so it's not really flying and birds have a completely different setup mm -hmm. to humans uh, in that sense um, and one of the big things is avian lungs versus human lungs and, and John West has done some really good work on this showing that the the avian lung is interesting because they have uh, parabronchi and uh, what that means is they have air sacs in two parts of the, the bird's anatomy and they just open and close um, together and what one does is draw air into the nostrils and the other one pumps air into the lung itself. So essentially what birds have done is separated ventilation and gas exchange. Mm -hmm. And it's a very efficient way of doing things. You might wonder why it is that birds can sing for so long. It's because mm -hmm. the ventilation part and the breathing part are completely different. Oh, wow. So okay. they don't have to breathe in because they're doing it all the time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, what that means is you have essentially a cross current um, blood flow al alongside the, the, the bronchi themselves. So they kind of cut across one another. And that's a very efficient way of achieving gas exchange. Well, that's sort of as like a, a counter current business. With the, yes. Yeah. And fish uh -huh. have that in their gills as well. Um, okay. And fish mm -hmm. are even more efficient because obviously dissolved oxygen is harder to get out, get out in water as well. So, so there's an element of that. The other interesting thing about fish is once they get up to a certain speed, they can go through ram ventilation. So they just keep their mouths open and they don't have to put any effort into breeding at all. So with so, fish, I was going to ask you, and I think there's a question on Twitter as mm. well about fibre types. I was thinking mm. is often fish are very white, very fast yes. twitch, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I guess have, have people looked at different fibre types. They have. There's a paper in Nature on, I think it's Skipjack Tuna, and they essentially just dissect them. And they then also had fish. They instrumented them with EMG to look at the, the muscles of the firing. And when they were just normally um, swimming around, there were strip bands of muscle fibers very close to the spine that were active and they were red muscle, so slow twitch. Mm -hmm. And then when they need to actually move at any speed, the muscle on the outside, the big muscle that you usually find in a restaurant, mm -hmm. that's your white muscle. And that's why fish have such good burst swimming capabilities mm -hmm. because they have mm -hmm. very large amounts of fast switch muscle along their flanks. And as a result of that, they're able to sprint sprint mm -hmm. swim much, much better than humans can. So yes, in terms of fiber type, we, we know that critical speed, critical power is very well correlated, positively correlated with type one muscle fibers and negatively correlated because with type two aerobic, muscle fibers you know, because of the aerobic side. Interestingly, W prime or D prime is not correlated with muscle fiber type. And I think that's probably because it's a capacity measure. So it is correlated with, uh, if you like, muscle mass. So the more muscle you have, the bigger your W prime will be, but it's not necessarily a fibre type specific um, issue in that sense. So uh, that, that's where that, that kind of comes in. Interestingly, we also see very strong correlations. His work done by Richard Ferguson here at Loughborough uh, with Emma Mitchell, looking at both fibre type and capillary density. And he showed there was, a, or rather Emma showed, there was a very strong correlation between capillary density and uh, critical power and capillary density around type one fibers, but also capillary contact area around type one fibers was very strongly mm. correlated with critical, critical power. Also, it was correlated with type one, uh, sorry, type two capillary contacts as well, which is, which is interesting because you say, well, maybe that means oxygen delivery to the type two fibers is useful. But of course, muscle is quite homogenous. So if you've got a lot of capillaries anyway some of them are going to just above mm. type 2 fibers so it's, it's maybe a spurious correlation but nevertheless just those things together, that, that, uh, just bringing yeah. this together to make sure i'm on the right page here so so you look at sprinters that are mainly fast fibers and endurance yeah. people that are mainly slow fibers yeah. sprinters would have a low critical power but a high w prime yeah, i'm talking about yeah. runners yeah and then yeah. kipchoge has would have a high critical power and a low yeah. w prime Yep. That would be, yeah, that would be the sort of correlation you expect to see. But the W prime part of that is probably more related to mass than it is fiber type per se. Mm 
we think, because when you've co whenever we've correlated W prime muscle fiber type, the correlation either isn't there or isn't particularly convincing. So, you know, it's, it's not it's not anything like as tight as the relationship between type one fibers and critical power, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we go if we go back to flight and think about birds. The other thing birds have is very very aerobic uh, muscle fibers. Um, in the sense they've got very high oxidative capabilities, very mm -hmm. high capillary densities. Um, this is probably exemplified in the hummingbird. So um, hummingbirds have been measured in various ways. And one of the really interesting ways is to disguise a plant or disguise a, a respirometer as a plant that they would normally feed in. Huh. So the hummingbirds will hover and uh, stick their uh, okay. beak into the, the supposedly plant. Oh. And actually what they're doing is measuring respiration whilst oh. they're on the, on the hover, because that's when they're hovering. The thing about bird flight is the most expensive thing is takeoff and hovering. It's mm. not moving at speed necessarily because you can glide. Um, and when they've done that, they've measured hummingbirds VO2 maxes of between 800 and 1,000 milliliters per kilogram oh. per minute. Wow. So we're now okay. talking way, way bigger way than um, anything. But you say they've got a lot of in. fast fibers, though, in their, in their wings, yeah? So uh, slow, uh, most, uh, yes, hummingbirds, yes, but they've also got very, very high mitochondrial density, mitochondrial that's volume. That's a good thing so you said that, yeah, that because yeah. people tend to think slow fibers have a lot of mitochondria, yeah. fast fibers yeah. don't, but the slow, yeah. the fast oxidators obviously do. Yes, they do. And the other thing, the other interesting thing is horses have very large proportions of fast switch fibers too. So unlike, it, well, when human sprints is measured, so Colin Jackson uh, was measured by Scott Trapp's group um, and his percentage of type 2 X fibers was about 30%. Um, and then uh, I think something like another 30% type 2A fibers. So very, very fast switch dominant you get the same sort of fiber type proportions in a thoroughbred racehorse. So they're actually type two dominant, but they're nevertheless very highly aerobic. aerobic so humans tend, to, humans tend to be a funny species in the sense that um, we have, you know, 50 to 60% type one fibers and they are definitely aerobic and our type two fibers are definitely anaerobic. Whereas mm -hmm. other species, tend not to have that sort of dichotomy in, in terms of function. Their fast switch fibers are fast switch to make their limbs move fast, mm -hmm. but they also have very good air oxidative it's, capabilities as well. It's funny you're saying about the, the, um, the birds having fast switch in their wings, because I remember I'd always make this an easy way to explain to students when I was teaching about fast and slow switch, is, is if you think of a chicken, now they're walking mm -hmm. around all day and their thighs and things are, are kind of red yeah. meat. You know, so they've yeah. got a lot of slow fibers, yeah. but then they just, you know, they just yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. fly for like two seconds and fatigue, yeah. and that's their wings, yeah. and, and they yeah. have obviously, yeah. you know, and the breast, yeah. very wide, yeah. very fast. Yes, and the, yeah. but the flying birds have kind of got around that by, you know, the oxidative machinery within those fibers is also highly capable of very, very high capillary exactly. densities as well. And, and the chickens so, are probably just straight, like, yes. yeah, yeah. not yeah. aerobic type. Yeah, uh, type exactly, uh -huh. exactly, okay. yeah. So, right. and then we start to think about bird flight and how that works and whether we can get a speed duration relationship from that. And at the moment we can't because exercising mm -hmm. birds to failure hasn't really worked in the past. Um, and so we're not entirely sure what a bird's, we, we have measures of hummingbird, but we might call it VO2 peak because we're not entirely sure they've plateaued because they obviously hover. We can't, we, what, what has been done is they've actually attached weights to hummingbirds to try and have a kind of an incremental test. Um, so we, we have a, a fairly good idea that we've, we've reached VO2 max there, but in the case of um, passerines, so birds that have um, you know, claws that go backwards, so birds that sit on perches, so your, your mm. starlings and things like that. Um, we've measured VO2, I say we have, that, that VO2 has been measured in those birds. Um, so uh, Butler, who used to work at the University of Birmingham here in the UK, uh, has done a lot of work there. And they tend to have a, uh, a U-shaped VO2 response. So at slow speeds, in order to maintain lift, they have to expend a lot of energy to do that. At intermediate speeds, they have kind of the best of both worlds. They have lift, but they can also glide a bit. And then at very fast speeds, in order to try and maintain that speed, they're having to flap more and therefore their, their VO2 rises. In larger birds, and we're now talking about geese, particularly migratory geese like the bar-headed goose, mm 
um, they have a very flat VO2 response profile. They've got a very large wingspan um, and they tend to have um, relatively low wing beat frequency. And so as a result, their VO2 response rises relatively slowly. I should point out though, that the metabolic cost of flight is still quite high. So just to get airborne and, and to stay airborne, you need to be developing nine times your basal metabolic rate which in a human is about 225 watts just to be in the air. And then to go any faster than that, you obviously have to increase that somewhat. So a, uh, a bar-headed goose um, flapping its wings at, say, 17 meters per second, which is the sort of speed that it would do in a migratory flight, its uh, VO2 response is going to be about 168 milliliters per kilogram per minute, something like that. That's, that's what it's been measured at, which is about the same VO2 max as a dog or a horse. So just to maintain level flight, uh, a, a goose is maintaining a VO2 that's the same as a horse's VO2 max. So what that's telling us is these animals have, or these birds have an extremely high aerobic capability because they can do this at altitude for six to eight hours at a time. So a really, realize, really I just don't even realize that we aren't all that flash, are we? I already knew that. I knew humans <laughs> aren't all that flash. Our brain is our savior, mm. I guess. Yes, yeah. We're not our overly brains good aerobically thumbs, and, yes. aerobic, and opposed no, to no, Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so those, those are, yes, our, our guile is what gets us through, really, and our cooperation, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, although yeah. now at kind of global levels, that doesn't necessarily but, work out all the I time. I guess seriously, though, like, I know we're kind of half joking, but... Um, mm. Yeah, so our W prime, our critical power, our VO2 max, our anaerobic capacity, our maximal cumulative oxygen deficit, whatever it is, we're pretty middle of the road if if that's yes. probably lower yes. than average. Yes. yes, yes. We're kind of alongside a goat or a steer in that particular case, yes. So in terms of athletic species, we're not really anywhere. Um, yes. there's, there's the old adage that we can sustain very low speeds for a very long time and persistence hunt. Um, yes. it is so the Dan Lieberman uh, uh, type hypothesis and there's some evidence for that in sub-Saharan Africa perhaps and some tribes do that um, whether that's a sexual selection issue or not is is another matter entirely whether that was something that was critical to survival. So is that true there was talk about the Australian Aborigines as well that mm. they they would sort of wear them down and they'd be sort of, yeah the animal would be sore the next day yeah and yeah. then they would get it. Is, is that yeah. true or is that sort of focused? Um, um, I think there's, there's, it, it, it's a way of acquiring meat, but there are obviously easier ways of acquiring meat because oh, um, you can, but yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah, that or you can stand in a stream, provided there's no crocs around, and wait for the fish to get used to you and then just hit them on the head kind of thing. That's a much easier way of persistence hunting by, again, yeah. using your guile and using cooperation. And it's not surprising that human populations have grown up around freshwater river courses and, and around coastal areas, because that's where you can find a lot of very easy to capture meat in terms of shellfish and that kind of thing. Um, having so, so where I was going with the, the migratory side, so humans mm -hmm. have been suggested to be pretty good endurance athletes. They are absolutely nothing on migratory birds. So the bar-headed goose, um, they've had they made, made telemetry measurements of these geese um, flying through the, uh, the Himalayas. And although there's, there's been some, and this is again, a little bit of folklore, the, this idea that they can you know, fly as high as an airliner, they can't really. Um, th those, those measurements or, or, or seeing birds at those altitudes, usually you're, you're looking down on them from 8,000 meters. They're not deliberately flying up to 8,000 meters, but they have been measured as high as 6,000 meters. And when they've tracked their pathway through the Himalayas, they tend to take the lowest possible path. But of course, the Himalayas being you know, low is, <laughs> is a relative thing in the Himalayas. And so they are having to get onto the Tibetan plateau and they're having to climb over 6,000 meters and obviously have to fly up to the altitude and fly at the altitude as well. And so what bar-headed geese have is a single point mutation that right shifts left shift, sorry, their, their oxyhemoglobin mm -hmm. dissociation curve so that they hold on to that oxygen for quite a long time until they get to you know, very low PO2s mm -hmm. and then they release it into the, um, into the, the uh, capillaries and then subsequently into the myoglobin, into the mitochondria. So they've got a very, very um, 
useful adaptation to fly at high altitude. And they can do this for hours and hours on end. So that's why we would hypothesize that their critical speed is probably in excess of 21 meters per second, um, which is, is clearly faster DPG? than any other. Is that the 2 um, DPG? You know? I think it might be related to that. Yes, mm. um, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but yes, it, it is a single point mutation they all have, oh, right. which oh. separates them from lowland geese, which mm. don't have that mutation, uh, which is very interesting. But the, the bar-headed goose is not even close to the best migratory animal that we've come across. And this is these are um, uh, work from uh, is it Gill? Yes, it's um, Gill uh, et al. And also. Um, James Jones uh, pointed this out to us in a, a really nice review article he did in uh, MedSize Sports and Exercise in 2016, looking at comparative physiology. Uh, and this is the bar-tailed godwit, which uh, is a migratory bird which uh, migrates from Alaska uh, down to your old hunting grounds in New Zealand. Mm. And it does that in one go. So over nine days, it travels about 11,000 kilometers in one effort. So all the way from Alaska down to uh, New Zealand. And these birds have been measured in terms of their energy uh, expenditure. They're obviously measured in terms of their anthropometry. And some of this is fortuitous because some of these birds at the start of the migratory flight accidentally flew into a radio antenna and killed themselves. And that gave the um, bird biologists an opportunity to dissect them and found they had a huge amount of fat stores and mm. also um, their alimentary canal was intact, whereas the birds they discovered towards the end of migration, they'd actually not only consumed all of their fat stores, they also, when they got to their feeding grounds, the first thing they had to do was rebuild their alimentary canal um, so they could actually feed again because wow. they, they'd consumed that much of their body in, in that, that mean, process. And you might wonder why they do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is that by flying over Essentially, it's more or less a direct route from Alaska to New Zealand. They could fly around the, the Pacific Rim, but then they've got parasites, they've got predators, and it's about two thirds further on. So even more distance, they'd have to stop and feed. and It just would be inefficient. So their, their main route there and back is straight over the top. They don't even go anywhere. And they don't even stop off in Hawaii because, again, you've got uh, mm -hmm. problems there with predation and that kind of thing. So they just go on the wing all the way for about 11,000 kilometers. Why do you say New Zealand? Because I was born in Dunedin, and near there there's mm -hmm. an albatross colony mm -hmm. as well, and they migrate yeah. somewhere yeah. a long, long way. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. I don't know if this is because you're English, but twice I've thought of Monty Python. So the albatross, that's what a Monty Python yeah, albatross. Yeah. And then um, and then when you said the, the parrot, I was thinking of the parrot yeah. and the uh, yeah, like the dead yeah. parrot. When you said about yes, the, the yes, claw. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hope you like Monty Python. You can't assume. I do. Yes. Do yes. Like um, yeah. But, uh... Yeah, they do. They, uh, yeah. It's um, and actually funny yeah. you should say that because we had um, when I was in Aberystwyth, there was a, a meme going around that the uh, Monty Python and the life of Brian had been banned by um, the church in Aberystwyth because they said it was blasphemous. Uh -huh. so it wasn't strictly oh, true, was. <laughs> but it, but it turns out that the mayor of Aberystwyth when I was there was actually the uh, female lead in The Life of Brian. The actress that played no. Mary right. was the mayor of Aberystwyth at the time. Right. And the thing they, what she managed to do was get the cinema to have, and I think it was, uh, there was an anniversary around uh, Monty Python and The Life of Brian, and they managed right. to get Terry Jones and Michael Palin to come and do a screening of uh, Monty Python right. and the Life of Brian and do a Q&A afterwards. So, there yeah, yeah uh, the, the Life of Brian is, uh, or the Monty Python is definitely a, a big thing with us over there here. And, uh, yeah, been in the same room as these guys. So it's, uh, <laughs> well, I yeah, saw a paper uh, about yeah. six months ago looking at the, the, the VO2 of the Silly Walks. Yeah, that was that was David Paul. Yes, he did, uh, he did that work. Yeah, so, yeah, and that was in one of those ones in the British Journal of... Uh, uh, British Medical Journal always does a kind of Christmas. Uh, that's right. Um, that's right. Not jokey piece, but it's just, it's you know scientific yes. work, but with yes. tongue in cheek kind of thing. Yeah. So, th so how about that. we start putting this together? I guess with the, yeah. I'm interested in in this in this um, yeah. curvature of the line and yeah. where yeah. animals fit on it and where do we fit on it? And, and like that. Yeah. So obviously, like you said, we're we're no no great shapes in terms of um, speed duration relationship. So the argument I would make is that although we don't have um, 
an actual speed duration relationship for birds. All of the evidence we have is that they've probably got the highest critical speed in the animal kingdom. Um, one of the things about migratory birds also is when they choose to migrate is an interesting one. If they choose to migrate normally in the evening or at night when it's cooler. And so if you're migrating at altitude, you've got um, you know, a slightly better PO2 um, to, to exercise in. But also they do the V formation. So they, they basically uh, work in the, the wake vortice of the next mm. nearest bird. And that reduces their wing beat frequency requirements. Like so there's all sorts uh, of little paces. Yeah, exactly. I was actually there in exactly. Austria. That was yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so obviously um, these birds have got the speed and the duration going on. Yes, they have. Um, and that's that's interesting because the the real take home message is that actually whenever we can measure this thing, it appears in the same format every time. So everybody sits along the same curve. It's just the curve is at different positions in terms of metabolic rates or in terms of speed. But the really interesting uh, comparison is between humans and crabs. And that's because crabs and humans last shared a common ancestor about 600 million years ago. And yet we sit not only on the same curve shape, but when we measure the metabolic response in crabs and humans above and below the critical speed, we see the same thing again. So we see steady state behavior below the critical speed, non-steady state behavior above the critical speed in both crabs and humans, which suggests the critical speed represents something that's a fundamental bioenergetic property of all species of animal, um, irrespective of what they're doing and what habitat, habitat they occupy. So that's why for me, it, it's a really fascinating area to delve into because it, oh. it hooks up so many other both okay. physiological aspects, but also ecological aspects as well. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's really interesting. Now, I want to finish. We brought up one. I brought up one question before from Twitter. I got one from this person called Wes. Uh, one thing I'd be curious about: uh, recovery time between efforts. Is replenishment of energy stores different across species, etc.? Does that? Um, and I've actually heard of people talking about recovery needs to be considered with critical power, yeah? Mm, yeah, so there is a W prime balance model that's been developed by Phil Skiba working with Andy Jones. Um, and this essentially says, if you're exercising above critical power, you'll burn through your W prime. But if you then momentarily drop below critical power, you start to recover it. So essentially what it's saying is W prime acts like a battery. So you can recharge it if you exercise below it and, and you burn through it if you exercise above it. So um, interestingly, I've just recently bought an EV and you can see the battery recharge. You kind of think of it in terms of critical power in that sense. So, you know, I've got a 150 kilowatt motor and then I can recharge it. And you can see the battery is the W prime side of things. But it's it's also the case that if if we have this curve shape in all species, then they should behave in that way as well. Though it, it hasn't often been measured. They have done intermittent exercise in geckos. And what they show is that exercising continuously in geckos at a particular speed, geckos can exercise much longer if they do that speed intermittently, which would suggest they basically have the same factors that determine that as humans do. And so that's really related to VO2 kinetics and the replenishment of anaerobic energy reserves of that kind of the phosphor creatine, the lactate, then anaerobic glycolysis, that kind of stuff. So classic interval training really can also be done in animals. And it really depends on what their VO2 kinetics are. So for example, a human's switch on, you'd have a, a time constant or a half time of say 30 to 40 seconds. A ghost crab will be about a hundred seconds. So okay. although a ghost crab could do intermittent exercise, it would replenish less energy for the same you know, time spent below critical speed as a human would, but then it's got a much higher D prime anyway because of its endurance parameter ratio. So some of the some animals will get around the intermittent nature of their exercise by having a very large anaerobic energy store, such as the crab. Others, like the horse, will have a very high aerobic capability, so they don't necessarily have to. Um, exercise okay. above their critical speed by you, too too large an amount. You've mentioned an awful, uh, uh, not an awful lot, a lot of uh, different creatures, and I keep thinking about this video I saw on YouTube once. It was a, it was a Americans call them shrimp. We call them prawns. Yeah, actually yeah. running on a treadmill. Did you yeah. see that? Yeah, I did see that, and that's not dissimilar to the way which uh, Bob Paul was doing his work. So you stick them in a loose site chamber, 
little mm -hmm. tiny treadmill and basically the crabs scurry along mm -hmm. sideways until they stop and they jump off yeah. the treadmill or what have you so that's basically the way it's done yeah that's classic. okay a uh, couple more twitter oh, i think it's the last one i think jose i understand dr burnley is rather critical with the lactate test right question mark many things between the production of lactate in the muscle cell and detection in the finger i'd appreciate he'd elaborate this on this further and on pref preferable tests for identifying thresholds such as ventilation Yes, we touched on yeah, that. so um, not critical of the lactate test per se, but perhaps critical of the perhaps unthinking use of lactate as a measure. Um, so when you talk about lactate and lactate thresholds, um, there's a huge controversy about which one you'd use to measure whatever. So you think about lactate threshold one, lactate threshold two, mm -hmm. onset of blood lactate accumulation, onset of plasma lactate accumulation, DMAX method. All of these things um, can be um, bewildering to anybody who's not come across them before. In my mind, there are two thresholds you need to be aware of. One is lactate threshold, which is the difference between lactate being stable at resting levels, although there's an awful lot going on under the bonnet there in terms of appearance, disappearance, mm -hmm. etc. Because all the, the a stable lactate profile shows this is the rate of lactate appearance in the blood is equal to the rate of lactate disappearance from the blood. And there can be all sorts of reasons why that's happening. When you get to a point where there's an increase in blood lactate concentration, that's because that balance between appearance and disappearance has, has got out of whack for some reason. And when you're doing incremental exercise, it's usually because you're increasing metabolic rate. And that's where we measure your first lactate threshold. There is a second lactate threshold or lactate turn point, which you can mm -hmm. sometimes measure. I find it, it can be quite difficult to identify, but that coincides relatively, or it's in the same ballpark as your critical power. So when you want to do these sorts of things, I'm much keener to use either maximal lactate steady state or critical power to measure that threshold rather than relying on lactate turn point because it can be difficult to, to spot that inflection point in a lactate curve. Um, in terms of preferred um, lactate threshold protocols, I'm quite keen on the idea of using relatively um, long stages for lactate mm -hmm. threshold determination. So five minutes, I would mm -hmm. say. I've, I've used four minutes and three minute stages before. I prefer four to five minutes as a, as a minimum stage length because then you can make sure that lactate, lactate equilibrium, if, if it's going to be there, will be there. And if it's definitely not there, it's definitely not there. It also means that uh, when you do these tests, you won't do that many stages above threshold because each stage lasts so long that um, if you are significantly above threshold, then you're going to be starting to fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you do three minute stages, you can end up doing quite a lot of stages considerably above, above the threshold, which you don't really need to identify it. So normally what we have is three or four stages below lactate threshold, and you don't have to worry about how many stages do below it because it's all very sustainable. It change anyway. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then you have maybe three or four or possibly five stages above the lactate threshold, depending on, on your fitness. And the, the increments between stages, usually it depends what athlete you're working with or what participant you're working with. But experimentally, 25 watts per stage will give you a, a good um, separation between those. If you've got an athlete you've worked with before, you might even go closer than that. If you know their lactate threshold was, say, 300 watts, then you might start the test at 250 watts and go up mm. 15 watt increments if you wanted to, to, to really get a fine-grained approach. Um, and the reason I talk about unthinkingly using lactate, um, there are a lot of commercially available lactate monitors now. Um, and using them can be quite, um, I wouldn't necessarily say difficult because it's not difficult to take a fingertip blood sample, but it is very easy to mess it up in terms of you know, squeezing the blood out and, mm. and that kind of thing can dramatically change the lactate concentration. You want a free flowing sample, mm. sweat can affect it. You want to clean it and mm. um, dry it and then get a good free flowing sample from it. Um, and, and using good technique is important. But also some of those lactate monitors, if you compare them to bench top lactate analyzers you get in laboratories, some of them can appear to be random number generators. So if you're looking at fixed lactates, I don't want to exercise above two millimoles of lactate, 
you might have a, a you know a variance in lactate concentration of plus or minus two millimoles anyway. So in trying to terms of trying to control exercise and training with those sorts of monitors, uh, or or trying to infer what's happened from them, may be quite difficult. So your best bet is to go into a lab and get it tested, um, and that's that's why we spend our time training on these things. Um, and training students to use kind of the benchtop stuff rather than the the, uh, the portable uh, lactate analyzers. All right. Well, this has been great. I think we're actually getting up to close to two hours. <laughs> it's been very interesting, but I do like to do um, a bit of a, a summing up at the end. So, you know, getting some sort of takeaway messages. So what, what, would, what would you, you know, like people to take away from all this? Um, so, yeah, to take away, I think... Um, the first takeaway is that the critical power of critical speed is a small part of a much bigger endurance physiology story. Now, that endurance physiology story is essentially that of exercise intensity domains. So the moderate domain, the heavy domain, the severe intensity domain, the extreme domain. And the critical speed or critical power concept is about modeling the severe domain specifically. But of course, it then also gives you the heavy severe domain boundary. So it gives you the opportunity to think about you know, exercising below it, you're going to be in the heavy domain, exercising <laughs> above it, you'll be in the severe domain. It's also useful because it's part of the thing that determines training zones. So we talk about zone one, zone two, zone three, if you want zone four and five if you want, or you know, other zone markers. It is related to that. So using critical power, um, or maximal steady state or functional threshold power <clears throat> as a way of separating training zones and training intensities is important. But also the real take home message is this is a fundamental aspect of physiology because we see in every animal species we've ever been able to measure it, it comes out this way. It's not like horses or goats or mm. crabs do something wildly different. Both the performance parameters and the physiological parameters behave in fundamentally the same way below and above this threshold, which should tell us it's physiologically meaningful. So it drives me mad when I see on Twitter people saying, well, critical speed is just a performance measure. No, it's not. The physiology underneath it is the really important part. And to understand that physiology reinforces the utility of using critical power as a performance model that can then be used to inform your understanding of what physiology is going to occur. If you're exercising above critical power, you're going to be non-steady state and all sorts of things are going to happen that are not going to happen below it. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a human being, a horse or a ghost crab, the same things are going to happen below and above that threshold point. So those are really the key things. Yeah, and I wonder if we could just, because I, I could imagine some people saying, okay, so we've got to stay below that, otherwise all hell breaks loose and, you know, we should be in zone two and cruising. Hmm. Do, you want, do you want to just flesh that out a bit? Like, as you said earlier, that yeah. you don't necessarily so, want to be just sitting in that comfort zone the whole time. You know? Yeah, so there, there's there's various ways and means of, of explaining that. So in terms of severe intensity performance, we're really talking about 5K, 10K running, um, it's 10 mile time trial if you're cycling that kind of thing most rowing events are in the severe domain if you exercise below the critical speed or critical power then we're talking about 25 mile time trials we're talking about half marathon 10 mile races those sorts of things these are performed at the upper end of the heavy domain so mm -hmm. there'll be a slow component but it'll be you know working in maximal steady state that's maybe why one of the reasons why i always found the half marathon to be my favorite distance because it's where you could lock in to a really good strong steady pace and just hold it and that was a, mm -hmm. a really nice way of racing whereas 10k hurt quite a bit and 5k hurt an awful lot because you're in the severe domain and then in the lower reaches of, of the heavy domain for most normal people the lower reaches of the heavy domain that's where you'd find your marathon performance you three four hour uh, duration of effort if you're an elite athlete then you can probably do your marathon at a relatively high fraction of your critical speed so 90 95 percent of critical speed if you're an elite runner doing a two hour marathon or close to two hour marathon that's where you'll be and that's because they've got you know very 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 high lactate threshold and, and critical speed in terms of a domain compression upward domain compression when we talk about below lactate threshold 
we start to talk about zone one, if you're talking about the polarized mm. training model, um, but also just below, uh, just below lactate threshold has been co-opted as zone two recently to mean you know a, a speed you can sustain just below your lactate threshold and being supposedly being a critical training speed i'm not necessarily sold on that uh, but it is the sort of speed that if you're doing ultra marathon work or you're doing things like a 24-hour bike ride or a 24-hour run if you're silly enough to do that then those that's the sort of intensity you'll be working at mm -hmm. to um achieve that kind of speed and so when you're when you're working with somebody who's doing very long duration exercise you would use lactate threshold as a speed limit so you so say you do not want to exercise above this power or this speed or this heart rate zone associated with it albeit you want to be a bit careful with the heart rate zone because of a cardiac drift and that yeah. kind of thing but you want to set you want to set a uh, speed limit, which at the beginning of the race or the beginning of the event is going to feel unbelievably easy. Mm -hmm. But that's why you set the limit, because if you go above it, you're into your heavy domain, you're going to be producing a slow component, you're going to draw down your energy reserves, particularly muscle glycogen that much faster. And that's why we set that speed limit. And that's why if you're doing a marathon and you're not an elite athlete, you're best to be doing it maybe just above your lactate threshold, because you exercise far above it you're going to burn through your carbohydrate reserves mm. that much more quickly. So understanding how the VO2 kinetics, particularly the slow component behaves in your relation to these intensity domains is really important. So it doesn't, it doesn't appear in the moderate domain. So you can exercise in a steady state without it. It appears in the heavy domain and gets bigger and bigger as you go up and up that heavy domain. And then in a severe domain, it not only appears, but it never stabilizes. So you drive VO2 to VO2 max. And that's what essentially shapes the power duration re uh, relationship or the speed duration relationship, as we now know, in all species. So that's essentially how all that fits together. Right. And then you set your training zones accordingly. So your moderate training is your zone one or zone two, if you want to call it that. Zone two, your heavy domain. Zone three is your severe domain where you'll be doing mostly interval training or long intervals mm. in the uh, lower end of the severe domain. And I think we said it before we came on i'm not sure but you're a bit of a fan of all roads can lead to rome is that right yeah so um fairy training is the way to go i think i don't think mm -hmm. there's any uh, and i polarized training you know it, it's one of those things that um i think is more an outcome rather than it, sh it shouldn't necessarily be a target so i don't think you should necessarily get too hung up on am i doing my 80 20 that kind of thing First of all, are you enjoying your training enough to carry on doing it? That's the first thing. Is there enough variety in it to keep you interested? And are you putting, yeah, yeah, consistency, and are you putting stresses in the right place? So, yes, there's there's a call for doing lots of volume. And there's also a call for doing some very specific intensity work. And if you're working at half marathons, uh, you want to be doing quite a lot of what we call sweet spot work just below mm the critical speed or, or the maximal steady state because that's your race pace and it, you'd be foolish mm -hmm. not to be doing some of that to get used to um, operating at that's that awesome. level yeah all right well great thank you very much for coming on it's been great no it's that's been, been an absolute and, uh, pleasure yeah. yeah thank you okay thanks a See lot you, mate. cheers bye-bye cheers bye i hope you enjoyed this podcast um, please like subscribe pass it on to your friends and colleagues check out the other podcasts thanks again